So uh, we are running out of time, so I'll be very brief. And I can only add to the hibernation thing that, yes, people can go into hibernation. And actually, all our parliament members do that when they go into session. Uh, this is a scientific proof. OK. Uh, the last talk is by uh, Professor Ivan Levin from the School of Zoology uh, in uh, Tel Aviv University. And he will uh, talk about sugar as a source for antioxidant for nectar rivers, which I don't know what it is, but maybe I will learn from the talk. Please. Not professor yet. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a new faculty in Tel Aviv University. And my lab is uh, the Nutrition Ecology Lab. And uh, we study nutrition through uh, extreme models of uh, physiology or uh, nutrition in animals. And I'll talk about sugar today. I really love sugar. Uh, I think sugar is a magic. It's almost alchemy. Uh, sugar can turn into everything in your body. Uh, and there are many animals that adapt to feed on sugar. Uh, we call them nectarivore. Uh, animals feed on nectar. And there is a beautiful co-evolution between plants to animals. Uh, plants produce the sugar. As nectar, sh ne nectar is basically water with sugar and some amino acids and <laughs> Uh, some other stuff in very low amounts. Uh, and the animals uh, feeding on this sugar, they have a beautiful adaptation to get the sugar, like this beautiful tongue of the bat, the nectar feeding bat, or the uh, beak of the hummingbird. But animals feed on nectar usually have the most extreme metabolic rates, high metabolic rates. Uh, it's especially because they have to reach the flower, they have to fly, and then they have to hover in front of the flower to get the nectar, which is extremely expensive and demands high metabolic rates. Uh, as Brian said before, insects can do anything, and there are many insects feeding on nectar. And the most extreme high metabolic rates measured in any creature are in the, uh, among the hawk moths that you see here, uh, in Ibu Rafrafim. Uh, they hover in front of the flower, they send their uh, proboscis into the flower, and, uh, and they uh, suck the nectar from the flower. And this hovering flight is very uh, energetically expensive. So uh, during my postdoc, I did a side project on uh, what fuels are used for this very high metabolic uh, rate demanding uh, flight. And I tried to, to see what happened, how the carbs are used in these animals. So I did the basic thing. I put the animal inside, inside a metabolic chamber. Uh, I know the concentration of the oxygen goes inside the chamber. And I measure the difference in oxygen at the exit from the chamber and the carbon dioxide ex exhaled by the animal. So basically, uh, by knowing the difference between the oxygen used by the animal and the carbon dioxide exhaled, I can calculate more or less what are the fuels uh, that the animal use. We call it a respiratory quotient, or RQ. I'll use RQ uh, from now on. And if the ratio is 1, I can tell that the animal is burning uh, carbohydrates. If I'll, if I'll measure your breeze now, uh, I guess from, because we ate like an hour ago, it should be one for, uh, for, uh, for us. If the animal is burning lipids, it should be 0 0.7. Usually you see it uh, after star starving for a few hours in humans. And if it's mixture or if it's protein, it should be around 0 0.8. So again, I put the hawk moss inside this metabolic chamber. I measure the RQ. And I got this value of 1.7. So as a scientist, when you get these high values, you blame the instruments immediately. And uh, I blame the instruments, and I change everything, and I calibrate them again and again. And then I wrote to the company, you sold us a malfunction analyzer. And they change, send us a new one. And again, I measure. Again, I get this very high value. So I tried other lepidopterans, uh, other uh, Day butterfly, monarch butterfly. Again, I put them inside the metabolic chamber, and the RQ is again 1.6. And I struggled for a few months with this problem in the machine, and then I had an idea. Maybe I'll take an animal that I know the RQ, that they burn all, always the same uh, metabolic fuel, and I put it in the chamber. And actually, there are such animals. Uh, bees, they only burn carbohydrates as fuel. So I just step out of the lab. There is a beautiful Vitex Siach uh, Avram tree out of the lab. And I took a xylocopa, a carpenter bee, 
put it in the chamber and beautiful RQ of 1. So all the measurements of high RQ are real, it's not a problem with the machines. Uh, and in the literature for the last 100 years, it's written that when you measure RQ above 1, it means that the animal synthesize fat. But if you check the chemistry of fat synthesis, there is no extra carbon dioxide coming uh, when you synthesize fat. Uh, so what caused this IRQ? And I am a field zoologist, but it makes me to go into um, metabolic uh, pathways, which was very scary. And luckily, I found a potential metabolic pathway in which you get carbon dioxide without consuming oxygen. And it's called the pentose phosphate pathway, or PPP. And in the first stage, the oxidative stage of the uh, pentose phosphate pathway, I'll zoom on this part, the first carbon of the glucose is coming out as carbon dioxide, and you get two molecules of NADPH in this process. Remember this NADPH, I will come back soon to this uh, uh, NADPH. So now I want to check if it's the pathway that uh, nectarivore use uh, when they consume the sugar. I use labeled sugar, I label the, with a stable C13, a stable isotope, uh, different uh, carbons on the mo glucose molecule. And I fed it to the moss, they are very cooperative. When they feel the sugar immediately, they, they suck it. And again, I put the animal inside the metabolic chamber. Again, I measure the RQ. And I measure the uh, labeled carbon dioxide coming from the animal. So I made a very simple experiment. Uh, when I label carbon number one, I expect, expect it will go into the Krebs cycle and comes as carbon dioxide. But if it's a pentose pathway, I expect it to go, come also from the pentose phosphate pathway and, and to get uh, labeled carbon dioxide. So if now I'll shut, the pentose phosphate pathway, I expect the RQ will go down uh, to 1, and I'll get less labeled carbon dioxide. And this is exactly what I get. When uh, the RQ goes down, there is less labeled carbon dioxide. So now I labeled carbon number two, number, number 2 and fed it again to the moss, and now I expect to get it only from the Krebs cycle, and I expect to get a lot of non-labeled carbon dioxide uh, from the pentose phosphate pathway. So now if I'll shut it down, the RQ again will go down, but we'll get more labeled carbon dioxide. And this is exactly when the RQ goes down, there is more labeled carbon dioxide. So I can tell for sure that the uh, pentose phosphate pathway caused this high RQ in, in these animals. So uh, what does mean that more than 40% of the glucose goes through the pentose phosphate pathway and then goes back to glycolysis. There is some loss of energy in this process, but it gives some advantage to the animal. And what is the advantage? So one advantage can be the, the fast remove of glucose from the plasma. Uh, it might improve also the exokinase function because it takes out the, uh, the product of this uh, process. And just to understand how much sugar these animals consume, if you compare it to you, uh, average body mass of a human being, it's like drink 80 bottles of Cokes in one meal. It's a huge amount of sugar going into their body in very short time. But if you look on animal feeding on nectar, they have high metabolic rate. High, high metabolic rate, usually uh, it's higher oxygen consumption, and then there is high potential for oxidative damage to the muscles. And uh, Animals feeding on sugar usually have, as I told you before, high metabolic rate. And maybe they use the pentose phosphate pathway to protect themselves from the oxidative damage. Uh, as I told you, the NADPH is product of the uh, pentose phosphate pathway. NADPH is a donor of electrons, so it can uh, uh, be relevant for anabolic process, but can function also as antioxidant itself. And uh, people, there are many people with deficiency in this pathway, in the pentose phosphate pathway, and these people are very uh, sensitive to oxidative damage. For example, if they consume faba beans that has uh, uh, oxidative uh, uh, agents in it, their blood cells can explode, and they call them uh, hemoly uh, hemolysa. Uh, but they are also resistant to malaria because if uh, malaria uh, parasite attacks their blood cells, 
their blood cells will explode and the, the uh, parasite will not be able to develop in their bodies. And they're also resistant to uh, many different kinds of cancer. And maybe I'll talk about it a little bit at the end. So I went back to the moss and I start to check if they have uh, their flight muscle, if they have uh, more oxidative damage uh, to the flight muscles when they fed and unfed. I did a very simple ex uh, experiment. I took two uh, groups of one-day-old moss. One group fed with water, one was fed with sugar, and I let them fly on the flight meals for four hours. So you see that the group that fed with sugar were flying almost double the distance, so I expect to have more oxidative damage to their muscles. But when we measured the oxidative damage, even they were fly more, the, the fed, sugar-fed group had much lower damage to their muscles uh, compared to the water-fed uh, group. So they were protected from the oxidative damage in their muscles. The next step was to check the glutathione levels. Glutathione is the strongest antioxidant that we have in our body, uh, and it's charged all the time with NADPH uh, and to this active form. And when we measure the uh, levels of uh, active glutathione, the reduced form, even in the, uh, the, the sugar-fed group were flying more, they had more of this active uh, glutathione in their, uh, in their muscles. So we got back to the literature and we start to look for uh, papers in which people measure IRQs. And here you see from hummingbirds and for sunbirds to fiat, uh, in both, they measured high RQs above one. And uh, these two papers, they uh, say that it's probably a, f a f lipid synthesis. The same for nectar feeding bats. High RQs about, uh, above uh, one, about 1.7. And I, su I suggest that animals, when they need to perform in a very high uh, metabolic rates or before they have a very high demanding performance, like for long distance migration, they will consume carbohydrates to uh, build this antioxidant potential to protect their, uh, their muscles. You see it very nicely in locusts. Locusts, before they start their migration phase, uh, they feed on high carbohydrate diet. The same for butterflies and songbirds that usually feeds on insects during migration, they move to carbohydrates. And I suggest that they build this antioxidant potential. Uh, before flight. <clears throat> now we are testing this uh, hypothesis in uh, the oriental ornets. They have very interesting biology because they alternate be from protein diet as a larvae to uh, carbohydrate diet as adults, and they lose all the ability to uh, process uh, the protein as adults, and they depend on the sugar produced by the larvae as their uh, metabolic fuel for their uh, performance. So, uh, for conclusion, uh, pentose phosphate pathway is a generator for antioxidant activity, and uh, it enables the very high metabolic rates that you see in animals feeding on sugar. So, like the common knowledge that there is a lot of energy in sugar, and animals feed on sugar, they are very active because of this energy. And I suggest that it's, it's a wrong conception. Uh, actually, there is much more energy in fat than in sugar, but if you consume sugar, you can produce this antioxidant potential, and then you can allow yourself to work in very high metabolic rates. And thanks to my collaborators, and there is some time for questions, I think. Uh, I guess it protects everything. Also in humans, I suggest it protects blood cells. This is why when you, you have deficiency in this pathway, uh, your blood cells are not resistant to, to... And also, all this fashion of antioxidants, I think it's wrong in our food, because even vitamin C needs the NADPH to, to be active. So it's more important the sugar in your diet than the antioxidants themselves in your diet. For antioxidant protection. These are good news. It means sugar is good for you. Sugar is good for you, for sure. <laughs> you know, it's unlike what they say that the, the 
because they say that the, everything that is good for life is either unhealthy, immoral, or illegal. So this bypasses that. Or fattening, sorry, I forgot to. Yeah. But I think it depends on the expenditure. So I think it depends on the, your uh, natural history. So uh, for humans, we work in very moderate metabolic rates. We are in, so, of course, we don't need so much sugar. Uh, for animal that needs to fly for a long distance or to be active uh, in a short time, it's been. So for marathon runners, I suggest uh, that for any athlete after doing the. the uh, the marathon, you need to put back sugar because it helps your body to build uh, the defense against all the radicals that uh, build in your body. So sometimes you find animals that are exhausted and uh, even they have a lot of fat and some sugar water can uh, make them to, to go back to life. And it's not because the energy, it's also, but it's also because it helps them to build the antioxidant potential.